Hi! In this video, let's take a look at this Hentac 2D72 handheld oscilloscope. It is actually a 3-in-1 device combining a 2-channel oscilloscope, a multimeter, and also a single-channel arbitrary waveform generator, all in this one small portable package. Size-wise, it is just a little bit larger than a full-size multimeter, as you can see here side-by-side -side, with my Unity UT61E+. I requested this from Banggood for a review as handheld oscilloscopes are quite useful in many situations. For instance, if you are probing a mains earth reference circuit, it can be quite dangerous if you are not careful when using a benchtop oscilloscope without a differential probe or some clever ways to float either the oscilloscope or the device under test, as the BNC connectors for most of the benchtop oscilloscopes are also mains earth referenced. And if you accidentally connect a ground clip from your probe to a live wire, for instance, you would essentially cause a short, and the resulting high current would most likely damage your probe. And worse yet, it could potentially blow up the ground traces inside your oscilloscope, which would definitely make it a very expensive repair. Also, a lot of times when using a scope to troubleshoot, we are more interested in the presence of a signal and not necessarily the precise measurement. So it is actually very handy to use a handheld device like this one, as you can do impromptu measurements very easily. And it helps when the portable scope is actually quite affordable. The 2D72 model is the top of the line in this series from Handtech. It is currently on sale for just $179 on Banggood's website, which is really a bargain if it does what it is advertised. I will leave a link in the description below for those who are interested. If you don't need the full 70 MHz bandwidth, which this uh, 2D72 model offers, and can live with just 40 MHz, you can choose the 2D42 instead, and that will save you 30 bucks. But just to be aware that the signal generator functionality is only available in the D series and not in the C series. And in my opinion, if you are going to buy one of these, you might as well just go for the D series, as having a built-in AWG is well worth the extra $30, in my opinion. The unit comes in with a nice hard shell case, and you do get two sets of these BNC to banana clips and a set of uh, multimeter leads. Now it's a little bit messy because I have uh, taken it out and used it a little bit for testing. But uh, you also get a single oscilloscope probe. And unfortunately, just one is included. But these lower bandwidth probes are quite cheap. If you do need to buy extra ones, I'm sure most of you probably have quite a few lying around already. So that would uh, not be a major issue. Now, my plan is to first power it on and show you some of the key functionalities and later on do a separate teardown video so that this video does not end up to be too long. So please subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already so that you will be notified when new videos come out. Okay, enough said, let's uh, power it on. By the way, there is a little bit of glare. Hopefully, once we power it on, you will see it a little bit more clearly and I do see that uh, the glare, unfortunately, I cannot get rid of it because the nature of this LCD screen. Also notice how fast it booted up. This is usually an indication that there's no underlying operating system on this device. Less abstraction typically means better performance, but the code is definitely more to the bare metal and highly specialized instead of having some, say, common standard libraries to rely on. In my opinion though, fast boot up time in devices like this is absolutely critical. So I think the designers made the right choice here for optimizing speed versus functionality. And it boots into the oscilloscope mode upon initial power up. Now I have played around a little bit prior, so some of the settings might have uh, deviated from the factory default. Well, now the unit does remember all the settings you changed so that when you power it back on, it actually goes directly to where you left it last time with all the adjustments you made. So I think that's a nice touch. Let me just quickly show you that. For instance, right now, if I switch to DMM and uh, if I just power it off and power it back on, 
you will see that uh, it actually remembers that you were last working in the digital multimeter mode. And of course, we can also change it to the AWG and it will do the same thing. So now let's go back to the scope and we will take a closer look. Let's first take a look at some of the specifications of this uh, oscilloscope. And as you can see here, the 2D72, that's the version we have, has a 70 MHz bandwidth. And the rise time is 5 nanoseconds. It's not super fast, but it is okay for the price range and also given the bandwidth of the scope. And the sampling rate, again, is on the slower side, is 250 meg samples per second for single channel, and that drops to half if you are using dual channel. But that should give you about 3-4 data points for sinusoidal at the maximum bandwidth. So that is uh, more than sufficient from a sine wave interpolation perspective. And the record length, uh, that's important for a digital scope as well. And you can see here we're at a maximum 6 kilo samples for a single channel, which is not super long. But uh, nevertheless, the memory depth does provide sufficient uh, data points for you to store some single shots waveforms. So later on, we'll take a look at that as well. Now let's take a look at the vertical. We're using a 8-bit analog to digital converter and for this price point of an oscilloscope I certainly am not expecting a 12-bit or any higher resolution than that so that is adequate. And when you take a look we also can limit the bandwidth to 20 MHz which is pretty typical. Of course if you're using a times one probe your bandwidth is reduced to 6 MHz. So those are pretty standard. And again, the rise time here, we see that is uh, less than 5 nanoseconds. And let's take a look at what else we should note here. Oh yes, so if you look at the voltage protection here, we have specified a 150 volts RMS as the maximum input protection voltage. I don't know whether or not that voltage applies to the times 1 probe or times 10. Now I would assume that's probably for times 1. And if that is the case, we just need to remember if you are living in a country where the mains voltage is say 220 volts, you probably want to pay extra attention if you're trying to measure mains voltage. And you want to double check your probe to make sure that the attenuation is properly selected so you don't cause any damage to your input circuitry. So as you can see, it is a rather basic dual channel oscilloscope but it does have most of the functionality you would expect to find in a typical DSO. But it does not have much bells and whistles beyond that. For instance, it does not have a protocol decoding feature, although I'm sure if a hand tech really wants to do it, they can probably implement that feature inside the FPGA. And also I did not see any mentioning of the input impedance to each of the oscilloscope input channels. So I assume that is probably 1 mega ohm only. And speaking of the inputs, those are located on top of the unit here. And you can see we have two channels for the oscilloscope and one single channel for the generator output. And the BNC jacks are flush with the unit at top here. And you can see that's a really nice design so that you don't accidentally bump into them and possibly cause damage here. And now I just hooked up the channel 1 input from a UT961E arbitrary waveform generator and the generator currently is outputting a 1 MHz sinusoidal output. So let me enable that output and we'll see what we observe on the oscilloscope. So that's the signal we're looking at. And uh, for that, I'm going to try the auto setting to see if we can actually automatically acquire that signal. Not sure if you heard the relay clicking. And uh, it does take a little bit longer than your typical DSO. Yep, so we obtained that signal with no problem. From here, you can see we have different ways you can adjust the oscilloscope. Now, the control keys are not your typical control keys. We don't have any knobs for the verticals and horizontals, so you will take some getting used to, but uh, it is actually pretty straightforward, and it does fit with this uh, nice uh, form factor very nicely. So let's, for example, want to adjust the time frame. We can use the up and down button to adjust the time scale here. Now, the time scale is only at a 1 to 5 interval, so you don't 
get to adjust, make any finer adjustment than that, but that should be sufficient for most of the use here. And if you want to adjust the verticals, you will just come to the channel and using the left right arrow to adjust the vertical gain. So it's quite uh, straightforward here. And of course, like uh, all the digital scopes, you have your triggering options here. So if I press that trigger button, you will see that we're currently triggering off channel one and uh, on the rising slope. Of course, you can change that to falling slope. And uh, of course, if you have some certain signals you want to trigger on both the rising and falling edge, you can do the double. So that's pretty much the triggering capability here. And next, I want to show you the single shot capability of this oscilloscope. Being able to take single shots is one of the most important features of any DSO. You can use that capability to capture a transient signal. And sometimes when you don't have a decoder, you can even use that to capture a train of a digital signal so that you can use to study later on and to possibly decode the signal. Now I have set everything up. You can see here the channel one I have set as a DC coupling and it's enabled. And uh, let's see the time base. We currently set at uh, 20 milliseconds per division. The trigger level is set up on triggering on rising edge and it's single shot mode. So everything's ready. And of course the trigger level is right here just above zero, so there could be some noise. So let's uh, enable the output of the power supply and we'll see what we got on the oscilloscope. Bingo, you can see that we immediately captured the turn on characteristic of that power supply and uh, it's relatively similar to what we have done last time using a dedicated digital oscilloscope. So of course you can also do some measurement once you have done your capture. So for that I'm going to go to menu. Let's see if I can find it. And uh, let's see. Yep, cursor. So let's enable cursor. And uh, let's go to the cursor themselves. By the way, you probably can't really see it very well, but the cursor is really are really those two vertical purple lines. So let me just tilt it a little bit. You can probably see now. Sorry about the glare, but after I move the cursors, I will again tilt the oscilloscope and show you that again. So let's uh, try to do some measurement. It's not very obvious how to do this, but uh, once you read the menu, you will figure out. And basically the cursor, you can activate cursor one and uh, you can move it using the arrow key. So let's see, where are we at? Let me just see that. Yep. So now let's say we want a, our start to be here at the initial jump. And uh, let's do the cursor two. Let's move it back. Whoops, let's move it further out. Let's say we're satisfied here, right? So now you can see that we have this increment, which is a 91.2 milliseconds. That's really the duration between these two trigger lines. So you can see now, here is my second trigger line. The first trigger line is uh, right at the origin here. So that's how you use cursors to do measurements on this oscilloscope. For this next test, I'm going to take a look at the actual bandwidth of this uh, oscilloscope. Although it's uh, stated as 70 megahertz, I wanted to make sure we do some real world testing to see whether or not it can hold up to that claim. And you probably heard the humming in the background. That's the HP 8642B currently used to generate the RF signal put into this oscilloscope. Right now, the output signal is set at 0 dBm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the output uh, signal frequency and to see at what point we either have significant drop in the amplitude or we simply cannot observe the signal anymore. So that's the plan. So let me start doing that. I'm going to go straight up to 70 megahertz. Now we're at 70 megahertz, which is the maximum spec bandwidth for this oscilloscope. You can see a little bit of wobbling of the waveform here. And uh, I can assure you that's not from the signal generator as that signal generator generates very, very clean RF signal. So to just to demonstrate that, I will show you what I'm seeing on the Tektronic oscilloscope 
for the same signal back there and you will see that the signal is not only very stable but uh, is also very clean and of course you can also see the uh, signal generator up there if I just tilt that the tripod a little bit that's the signal generator so now let me continue increasing the frequency and uh, now we're at uh, 80 MHz by the way let me see if I can enable this on-screen menu here so that you will see it more clearly as this one does have that uh, capability as well so let's uh, see if I can find that cursor measure and I think measure is the manual here so let's turn it on yep you can see the measurement here so you can see that frequency right now is reading at 80 megahertz so it's already exceeded our 70 megahertz frequency bandwidth and now I'm increasing to 90 and 100 so actually it's quite impressive now we're at 100 and the amplitude still did not drop in any significant way so that is certainly promising but we do start to see a lot of distortions because remember this oscilloscope can only sample at a rate of 250 mega samples so at this frequency we're only talking about 2.5 samples per waveform so clearly at some point the waveform will be very distorted because we do not have enough samples anymore so let's increase to 110 megahertz as you can see that uh, we are already getting weird artifacts from the input whereas the actual waveform is uh, just a sign of pure sinusoidal so probably if I were to say that the maximum usable bandwidth really is uh, 100 megahertz for this uh, 70 megahertz scope not bad at all and uh, next I want to show you the capability of this uh, oscilloscope for measuring a modulated signal the signal is outputted from the UT962E as a 1 megahertz sinusoidal carrier frequency with a 10 kilohertz amplitude modulation and uh, the modulation depth is set at 100 percent so a lot of the scopes have uh, issues displaying the modulated signal it's not the easiest uh, waveform to display so let's see how this uh, oscilloscope behaves so now I'm enabling the output and uh, let's uh, see if we need to change the time base a little bit so let's yep so now we can see the modulation now it shifts 11 right a little bit let's see if we can adjust the trigger to make that better and uh, uh, we're okay so it looks like we are able to capture the actual modulation waveform in a relatively stable display so that's actually not a problem at all so this uh, oscilloscope in fact is behaving quite well given the tests we have done this scope actually is quite impressive so far of course being a dual channel oscilloscope you would expect we would be able to see both channels working at the same time and indeed right now I have my UT G962E outputting two signals one to each channel and the first sinusoidal is a 2 kilohertz signal and the square wave is at uh, 6 kilohertz three times the frequency of the first channel and yes this uh, scope is also capable of displaying Lisa Jure pattern as you can see here and I have one channel putting in a 3 kilohertz the other channel putting in a 4 kilohertz and we see the pattern with no problem at all so from our limited testing I'm actually quite satisfied with the performance of the oscilloscope and uh, the controls are really responsive in fact it's better than a lot of uh, several hundred dollar dedicated digital oscilloscopes and uh, this one certainly had the implementation done right and of course as I mentioned earlier the functionality is a little bit limited but uh, nevertheless it does exactly what it's supposed to do and uh, it does it pretty well now let's move on to the digital multimeter functionality and for that we just uh, switch the button and it goes right into the digital multimeter mode by the way this uh, unit does stand up it has this uh, relatively 
I, I wouldn't call that the very sturdy, but a little bit flimsy as uh, you have to pry it really hard to open up the stand. Sometimes you get a feeling you might break it, but actually it uh, pops up with no problem. But I will let it stand up for the next set of testing. Keep in mind that this is only a 4,000 count multimeter. It uh, really is fairly basic. It doesn't have a lot of the range capabilities and the resolution is on the little bit low side. But uh, nevertheless, it is a full functioning multimeter. And uh, the beauty of that is you can use this uh, one device to do all sorts of the measurement. But uh, you can see there's some limitations. For instance, what I highlighted here is uh, specifically you need to pay attention to is the capacitance measurement mode. It can only measure up to 100 microfarads, which is uh, relatively low when you think about it. And uh, also the diode mode, you can only output one volt voltage. So for the LEDs, you can forget about using this multimeter to do the testing. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the multimeter itself, but I do want to kind of show you the voltage measurement accuracy here. For that, I hooked up with my EDC2168, the voltage standard, and I'm going to dial in one volt at a time as uh, you don't have uh, any way of uh, manually range the meter, so it defaults set to volt volt. So let's take a look at how accurate that is. So let me dial in one volt. And uh, you can see that we do have a little bit of uh, uh, off here, and uh, that's probably within spec. Shouldn't be too much a concern. Two volts, three volts, four, because it's a 4,000 counts meter, so you can see that we actually dropped one digit of resolution here. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. As you can see, there's really not uh, too much issue with the meter, besides this being a little bit slow. Next, let's take a look at the ohm measurement range. First thing you notice is there is no way to zero out the reading. Actually, I combed through the manual and did not find a way to zero it out. So that already tells you that this is just a very rough measurement and you don't really get that high level of uh, precision when you are at uh, the very low end of the range. Now, of course, right now I'm shorting this out. It, it, show that it's only 0.2, so it probably does not matter that much. And now it goes back to zero. Now, uh, by the way, that is probably because of these kind of leads. And they're not uh, really gold-plated, so the contact resistance sometimes changes depends on where you make contact on these leads. Anyway, so let's say right now we do get zero ohm. So let's take a look at that, uh, 100 uh, ohm. Of course, this is a high precision resistor, but uh, this meter is not right now. But nevertheless, we'll get an idea. So let's take a look at the measurement. It is uh, very, very slow, but it does eventually come to the, you know, approximate reading here. Some of these uh, last digit jumping, I suspect, is probably because of the leads themselves. You saw how slow that was, so definitely not something you would use on an everyday basis. But if you don't have any other meters, this certainly can get you by with no problem. So let's take a look at a continuity. And, and for that, let's see. Ooh, it's very scratchy. So this is not latched. So given this uh, tip this is not gold plated, it's definitely not uh, latched at all. But uh, nevertheless, it uh, does measure the continuity here. So let's uh, go to see if we have any other measurement we can see. I measure DC amp, AC amp. So let's, uh, let's take a quick look at uh, the DC amp measurement. For the DC current measurement, I'm going to use my 100 microamp current standard that I built a while ago to do the job here. And uh, let me try to plug it in if I can. And there's some kind of a molding issue on the plug. Uh, let's try again to see. Yep, now we plugged it in. Okay, so let me do DC milliamp. Wow, this is uh, really off. And this is actually 100 microamp, so I would expect to say 0 0.1. 
and uh, now it is a reading 0 0.109. Although the 109 microamp measure seems to be a little bit far off, but if you look at the spec here, in fact, in the lowest current measurement range at 40 milliamps, you actually only get a resolution of 10 microamps. So that is still within range. And by the way, earlier I said that it did not have a millivolt measurement range. Actually, I stand corrected. Now I'm seeing that we do have a DC millivolt measurement. So let's uh, hook up the voltage standard again and uh, do some measurement in the millivolt range. So for that, I'm going to increase it, uh, let's see, 10 millivolt at a time. 10 millivolts, not bad. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. So not bad at all. And now let's uh, just do a quick capacitance uh, measurement for completeness. And we have here a 15 microfarads capacitor that should be well within the range of the 100 microfarads that is able to measure. So let's take a look. Okay, so yep, it measured uh, 14.39, which is uh, close enough. But again, the speed is uh, very slow. So now let's just take a look at uh, diode measurement while we're on the screen here. So here I have a silicon diode, and uh, let's take a look again. Of course, the other way around. Yeah, no problem. But uh, because the output is uh, one volt, so I don't believe we can measure an LED. And I just want to give it a try. Here I have a white LED. So let's take a look to see if we are able to measure it. Nope. As expected, which is exactly what the spec said. So the 4000 count multimeter functionality of this uh, handheld oscilloscope does exactly what it says. Now the measurement is on the slower side, but for voltages and current measurement, it seems to be okay. And the one thing I forgot to mention is that the 10 amp range is actually unfused. So I would recommend you not using this uh, range at all, if all possible, because if you are measuring some unknown high energy circuit and you accidentally shorted it, and you could potentially blow the traces inside and uh, cause an expensive uh, repair. Now, this is a really uncommon to have a unfused measurement range on any meter, but uh, I kind of understand why they did this because of the limitations on the interior space. And also this meter is really not designed to be your standard multimeter. So you really only use that once in a while when you absolutely have to. Just keep that in mind. I certainly would not recommend using that uh, 10 amps range. Next, we want to check out the AWG functionality. Let's first take a look at the specs here. And you can see that we have a single channel arbitrary waveform generator. And here are the maximum frequency you can generate for various uh, waveforms here. One thing to notice is that the sampling rate is actually at 250 mega samples per second. That is actually quite impressive. It is uh, better than the Unity's UTG962E arbitrary waveform generator. And that one only operates at a 200 mega samples per second. So that is clearly a benefit here. It does specify the output impedance is 50 ohms and the DAC used to generate the waveform is a 12-bit DAC. So that gives enough resolution to the output waveform. And we also notice that uh, the waveform depth is at 512 samples. Now let's switch to the arbitrary waveform generator. So this user interface is uh, quite easy to understand. You just press this uh, go button and it should generate a output. And what I have done is I have linked up the output from the arbitrary waveform generator to the input of the oscilloscope. For this unit, the arbitrary waveform generator and the scope they are working independently, which is actually a real benefit because you can jump back and forth. You can 
start a waveform and then go to the oscilloscope and observe the waveform. So let's give that a try here. So the default is a square waveform and I'll put at one megahertz, two volts peak to peak. So let's, uh, and also let's see what others we have. We also can change the offset and duty cycle. So let's not worry about that. Let's uh, just use the standard square wave and we generate, enable the output and let's switch to the scope. And we should see that if, uh, of course, let's uh, let's use uh, auto adjust to acquire the signal. And uh, as you can see, we did acquire that signal, but uh, I wasn't expecting that the channel two would be turned on. So let me turn off. Let's try it again. Yep. So now it's a lot better. Sometimes I notice that uh, this auto acquisition sometimes does not do it correctly the first time. You have to use it multiple times for whatever reason, but uh, usually the second time around, you are able to acquire the signal with no problem. And if it doesn't, sometimes you just have to go in and manually change it, uh, which is uh, not a big deal. But right now you can see that we are displaying that uh, arbitrary waveform generator generated the square signal here. And it is a little bit of wobbling also, as you can see from our other waveforms. And I think that's just a, a artifact from the oscilloscope. And I change it to vertical position again, as there's the reflection is really annoying. And I probably should have done the whole shooting in vertical, but actually the vertical is really hard to operate just because of the tilt stand uh, direction here. Anyway, so let me change it let's change the output again let's go to the awg and uh, let's uh, try to increase the output uh, frequency here by the way you can either use the up and down button to increase or decrease the frequency or you could use the uh, double click here and you can use the arrow keys to go to the specific digit you want to enter and also enter it that way but anyway so now let's uh, set it at the maximum at 10 megahertz let's uh, switch it back to oscilloscope and uh, take a look for some reason, we see this a little bit of uh, oscillation here. Uh, again, I'm pretty sure that's just an artifact introduced by this oscilloscope. Let's uh, reduce the time a little bit. Increase the time base, rather. So as you can see that uh, it is not really square anymore. That is the five nanoseconds rise time that we mentioned earlier. But uh, regardless, that should not be a major issue. And uh, you do see, interestingly, the waveform, the width appears of these uh, square waves are actually changing. I wonder if that is some artifact from the synthesizer, but uh, let's actually put it on a oscilloscope and take a look. Actually, that is not the oscilloscope on this Hantac 2D72. That is actually from the signal generator. As you can see here, I'm outputting onto that uh, Tektronix oscilloscope. And you can clearly see that the waveform is changing shape. Hmm, that is interesting. That is probably the specific design of the arbitrary waveform generator. And uh, let's say, let's change it to a ramp and go back. And uh, let's auto acquire that. The uh, ramp signal looks uh, just about right. So let's uh, change it to what else we got. We got a sine wave. I expect the sine to be very clean. So let's actually increase the sine to the maximum and uh, take a look there. So let's see what the maximum is. 25 megahertz. And uh, let's uh, go to the scope here, do an auto. The auto adjusting does take a little bit of time compared to most of the digital scopes, but uh, you know, it's uh, livable. And uh, again, we see a little bit of a wobbling of the waveform. That, as I mentioned earlier, the time base inside this uh, handheld device is not really that stable. So that is to be expected. This waveform generator does have arbitrary waveform generation capability, but when I first got it, it actually didn't come with any waveform. I'm not sure if it's just a specific firmware where it's uh, the same for all other the 2D72 series, but uh, nevertheless, I had to go to the computer and uh, use a computer program to generate the desired waveform. For example, this first arbitrary waveform one 
is a staircase signal that I had earlier used a computer to upload. Now it's fairly straightforward to do that. All you need is literally a spreadsheet uh, full of uh, number points and uh, it's 0 to 512 and at each point you give it a value between minus 1 and 1. So that's your verticals and uh, that's fairly straightforward. And also the waveform obviously persists onto the handheld device, which is definitely a plus compared to the Unity UT962E where I showed you actually cannot persist your arbitrary waveform onto the device. And uh, you can only use it when the device is powered on, which has a huge limitation. But on the other hand, that 962E does come with uh, more arbitrary waveforms than this Handtech one. But nevertheless, now let's uh, I'll put this uh, uh, staircase signal here. And we go back and uh, what we're looking at, oh, so probably the time scale is wrong again. So let's uh, use auto to rescale it. See if we can capture that signal again. Ideally, we should see, yep, so now you can see the staircase signal. Now, keep in mind, right now you see these are not well as well defined as it should be because right now we're at five megahertz. So that is actually quite high for typical use of a staircase signal. So let's go back here and change this to maybe, uh, this time let's use this. Let's do a one kilohertz. So one, and uh, let's do a kilohertz. So now let's go back to scope and uh, we reacquire it again. And hopefully this time we're gonna get a much cleaner signal as the DAC gets a longer time to settle. Yep, as you can see here, we indeed get a much cleaner signal. Although I don't believe the automatic acquisition actually did the vertical correctly, as it is kind of a squashed here. So let's uh, take a look to see if we can correct that. I think it's channel maybe. Yeah, it's a channel, sorry. So that's the controlling the offset. And Okay. Yep. So this looks like a more appropriate setting for the scale here. And uh, as I explained earlier, the automatic acquisition here does seem to be a little bit touchy. Sometimes you run it multiple times, you get different results. But anyway, after I manually changed the Y axis, now the signal looks more proper for the current setting here. So as you can see, the staircase signal looks pretty decent here. And uh, this arbitrary waveform generator, you can actually store multiple waveforms. Of course, I have another one is uh, going down the staircase. And uh, I also have a noise waveform that I generated using the computer. But uh, you can store up to four of those arbitrary waveforms, which should be plenty for typical use. But before I wrap up this video, I thought I would uh, do some measurement on the spectral purity here. For that, I'm outputting a 20 megahertz. The amplitude is set as 0.63 volts. That's roughly zero dBm. And I'm putting into this uh, spectral analyzer via this DC block here. So right now the output is on. I'm going to set the spectral analyzer to be starting from zero megahertz and uh, end with 40 megahertz and set a resolution bandwidth to be 10 kilohertz. So let's see what we got. So here at the center frequency, that's our 20 megahertz signal, which is sitting at zero dBm, as you can see here. And we have a few sideband harmonics, and these are probably coming out from the synthesizer. And uh, they are at about 50 dB down. So that's actually not that bad. And if you look further, that we have this noise floor, which is sitting at about uh, 85 decibels down below the carrier frequency. And if I turn off the output, you will see that uh, the noise floor actually was not that much more than the baseline here. So let's re-enable the output. So this is the spectrum from the Hentec 2D72. Now let's, uh, just for curiosity, let me compare this with a few other frequency synthesizers that I have in my lab. 
And uh, what we are looking at now is the spectrum coming out from the Unity UT962E, also setting at 20 MHz output at uh, 0 dBm. So you can see that the spectral characteristics are actually drastically different than that from the Hantac. And in that, we have a slightly raised noise floor, and uh, the roll-off is actually much wider than the Hantac. And also we have quite a few frequency lines that are very close to the center frequency, which is 20 MHz, even though those are down 1, 2, 3, 4. And those are not quite low as the Hantac output, so these are actually above minus 50 dBm. So that is actually not as good, in my opinion, as the Hantac synthesizer that uh, you saw a little bit earlier, but uh, it was a little bit cleaner across the, the spectrum, so you know it's neither here nor there. But also the noise floor has a rather wide region that's actually above the minus uh, 80 line here. So as you can see, if I turn it off, you'll see that the noise drops off uh, dramatically, and if I turn it back on, the noise comes back on again. Yeah, so in my opinion, the hand tag behaves a little bit better and the Unity is UT962E. And of course, just out of curiosity, now I hooked up uh, my old WaveTech 100 MHz synthesized uh, frequency generator up there and outputting a 20 MHz 0 dBm signal, as you can see. Now, the characteristics are actually drastically different. This is a much older synthesizer. Keep that in mind. The noise floor is actually about 80 decibels down instead of the 85 decibels compared to the other two synthesizers. And so if I turn off the menu, you'll see that the noise floor is significantly higher than the reference noise floor of the instrument of this uh, HP 8566B. But uh, other than that, of course, we have uh, many other tones coming out. These are unwanted. These are harmonics or some of the spurious signals. But uh, nevertheless, these are really far down. You can see here, this line is the 50. So again, all these harmonics are under that 50 decibel from your carrier frequency. So that's actually not a bad synthesizer at all. And uh, in that regard, the hand tech actually is comparable to this wave tech. Actually, it has a much better noise floor as well. And while we're at it, let me just show you what uh, a real clean signal looks like from an RF generator. So now the signal output is from my HP 8642B signal generator, and that is a professional RF signal generator capable of reaching up to 2.1 GHz, but right now we're outputting a 20 MHz signal at 0 dBm output. So as you can see, the noise floor barely raised above what we have as the reference before we turn on the output. So let me turn off the output. You will see that. This is the output off. This is the output on. So clearly the noise floor of that 8642B is actually below what we can measure with this 8566B spectral analyzer, which is a very, very clean output signal. But of course, that's a RF signal generator, and uh, the other ones we have are just some digital synthesizers that are really not meant for serious RF work. But nevertheless, this is what uh, could be. You can see how clean this signal is. And keep in mind that uh, the 8642B was from the 1980s, whereas right now we're looking at a few pieces of modern instruments. So I hope you enjoyed this review of the Hentec 2D72 3-in-1 handheld oscilloscope. Please remember to subscribe and give it a big thumbs up. I will catch up to you next time.